All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and get this rolling. I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Dr. Eric Huffman, and I conduct my postdoctorate research in a very unique field called cyber psychology. What cyber psychology is, is the mix between cybersecurity, psychology, and a little bit of neuroscience blended into there. What I'm gonna present to you today is a series of three studies with over 10,000 participants. What I found is that there's more biological vulnerabilities being exploited than technical vulnerabilities. And we're gonna keep this at a level of you as a person. Nothing different between myself, yourself, it's just how do people act in a cyber environment? How do people react when they're attacked on a cyber environment? Because we all know somebody that has been fished. We all know somebody that has been attacked and we all know different people, different ethnicities, different races, different genders and all that. But the same results continue to happen. So there's a biological issue, it's not a technical issue. This is founded on one thought, is that cybersecurity is closer or more closely related to psychology than it is computer science. And that's the notion that I would like to think is true, 100% true. That in security, we're looking at technical problems, but however, from a physical, from a personal, from a psychological standpoint. Um, what makes you the victim? What makes that person the attacker? So, what, what we're talking about when we're talking cybersecurity, people throw the word around cyber all the time. We're talking about an environment that we created. This is not an environment that we were built for. This is something we built around, so we're learning to operate in it. We're not talking about trees, forts, or a desert. We're talking about computers, phones, and tablets. There is no animalistic instinct that is going to help you in this environment. There is no biological weaponry that's going to help keep you alive in this quote unquote cyber war. You're going to have to reason your way through and you're going to have to make the right decisions, which gives cyber criminals the upper hand by far innately. Just naturally, they have the upper hand in this environment because if someone runs into this room just screaming all crazy, there's biological functions that's going to help us out in that situation. When you're behind a computer screen, those same things don't happen, and we're gonna talk about that in detail today. So, as we continue down this journey, if we continue thinking through this cyber environment, every single person in this room can be hacked. And I mean that. There's a lot of people that I speak with in my studies, in my research, and they say, well, I don't fit that 99%, that 98%, like I, I'm, I'm part of that 2%. Not really, because this talk, the barriers are gonna come down. The gloves are gonna come off, and we're gonna talk about the truth behind cyber attacks, and we're gonna talk about the truth behind phishing. Because how we train is not how we fight. When we send out a phishing campaign, we send a phishing campaign uh, with probably, hey, here's your Coca-Cola, you won this Coca-Cola uh, contest for $10 million, we need your information. That's not the real fight. They exploit you, by how you feel. They may exploit you by how you feel about your husband, how you feel about your wife, how you feel about your kids. Because they don't care. And those emotional triggers, whether they know it or not, psychologically put them at an advantage for every single person if they execute this correctly. This is the number of records that we have lost since 2013. It's gone up since, obviously, I took a screenshot, and by the time I put the screenshot up, you know, more records have been lost, because if you look, 76 records per second are lost. So if we think about the rate of innovation, the rate of innovation within technology, the rate of innovation in technology has gone up exponentially. It just continues to rise in. That's something everybody knows. But if you look at the rate of innovation, but you look at the rate of attacks, you would think the more we innovate, the better the security is. However, in this industry, we, the more we innovate, the better the hackers get. 
This is one of few industries that is actively working to put itself out of business. If we perfect cybersecurity, you don't need many cyber professionals. You just need them to set it up, set it, and forget it. But in this industry, we call it cyber now. Before, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, probably even 10 years ago, we, took, we just call it information security. We've been working on the cyber. We're now the cool kids at the club. So we now call it cyber because that's a, that's a cool word. But information security, it's been there. And we've been working on this since. And it's just getting worse and worse and worse. As a cyber professional myself, I like to admit this, no offense to anybody. This is the only industry where you do poorly for 30 years and you get raises. We did poorly for about 30 years and now we're getting raises. So this caused me to think, with the technical problems that we're having, with the technical issues that we're facing, why aren't we producing results? Why aren't we producing, why aren't the rate of successful attacks starting to decrease even a little bit? They estimate that by 2021, cybercrime is going to cost the world anywhere between six trillion and seven trillion, with the T, dollars. We got to get a little bit better at this. So I started thinking about it. This is cyber criminology 101. The basic profile of cyber criminals, you know, they're short-sighted, they're open, and however, they don't care about others. The, the profile for cyber criminals is very much like the profile for criminals in general. They want information, they want it quick. They want results, they want the results quick. They need the information and they need it quick. Just like criminals, they want money and they want it quick. They want drugs, they want, they want it quick. This environment gives them the opportunity to do that time and time and time again. Because computers, unlike us, unlike people, computers, your firewall, your antivirus, none of that responds to propaganda. You do. Your firewall is going to do what you program it to do. Your firewall is going to block the attacks that you designed to block it. The only thing being fooled is you. As the entire environment changed with technology, one thing remains stagnant, us. People are the most vulnerable part of every cyber environment by far. Every cyber professional, if they're being honest with you, they will tell that. The computer works fine until John touches it. The computer works great until Dr. Huffman touches it. And then all of a sudden it breaks. And we need to understand what's responding to propaganda. And actually, if you look at a car salesman, they will tell you all about social engineering because they do it all the time. And if you ask yourself, do you actually respond to propaganda? Whenever I see a commercial for a really good steak, oh yeah. Yeah, marketing gets me. Emotionally, marketing gets me. And that happens for everybody. That's why it's a multi-million, I'm sorry, multi-billion dollar industry there. Let's keep this going. How do you get influence? If we're talking about responding to propaganda, we're talking about influence, and we're talking about influencing behavior. What the cyber criminal wants to do, they want to manipulate your behavior, and they can do that by influencing you. Number one, reciprocity, which is if I give you something, you're going to feel indebted to me, so you're going to give something back. Back in the 1970s, Dr. Kuntz was a sociologist and he conducted a study. The study was extremely simple. He wrote 500 Christmas cards to complete strangers just looking in a phone book. Back in the day when you used to look in a phone book. You look in a phone book, you find names. He wrote Christmas cards, 500 of them, sent them out. Just, hey, Merry Christmas, wish you and your family well. Sent them out. For 15 years straight, he received Christmas cards back. Just kind of, hey, Merry Christmas, hey, thank you for everything. 15 years to consider, let's take this even further. One more step further, they did a study on service, on fast food service, fast casual service, when a server comes and they, they give you your food, they give you your drinks, things like that. If that server gives you a mint, tips go up 30%. They gave you a man, or if they give you part, if they comp part of your meal, if they say, hey, you know what, drinks on me, then you're going to tip more than what that drink cost. Tips go up. This is reciprocity. Next, we talk about liking. P 
People like people emotionally and or physically. So if Will Smith, who's one of my favorite actors, probably my favorite actor ever, you know, Will Smith, I, Robot, he saved us. Independence Day, he continues to save us. He's doing fantastic work. If he walks in, I'm going to smile. I'm going to be happy. I might walk up to him. I might shake his hand. And I won't do that to any other stranger. But I will do that to him. I like him. And because I like him, he can influence my behavior just by being there, just by walking in. Same thing happens if someone looks like my grandmother, if she, sa if she sounds like my grandmother. My grandmother's from the South, so all the STs turns to SKs. Like, instead of street, it's street. Instead of scra strawberry, it's strawberry. If you speak like, I'm, I'm a smile, because it reminds me of someone I know. And so you can influence me, because I like you. I, I may not just fall in love with you, but I like you, so you can influence my behavior. A little bit. And all, all you need to do is influence my behavior just a little bit. Social proof, we know what social proof is. And just understanding that, hey, you are a person and you know what you're talking about. You know what you're talking about. You've been there and I can, you can validate what you're saying. If we talk about authority and scarcity, just real quick to wrap these up. The authority, someone runs in here again, yelling, screaming like crazy. And if Rodney stands up, and he says, hey, I need you guys to go over there, completely calm, in the norm. And he just takes off. More people are going to follow him. Authority, people follow people that know what they're doing or look like they know what they're doing. That's it. If you know what you're doing and you sound like you know what you're doing, I'm like, I don't know what this is. I'm scared. Rodney's calm. I'm going with Rodney. That's how this works. Also, scarcity, people find value in things that are going to go away. Limited time offer. You know, limited time offer, there's value in it. I want it, I have to have it. So what is going on after they influence your behavior? That, what they're doing next to you is completely mind-boggling. We're going to dig into this. And I'm not saying that cyber criminals are psychologists, but however, whether they know it or not, it is happening. It is happening, and it's happening time and time and time again. They give you information. They don't give you the entire story. They give you what lawyers call half-truths. Not lies, half-truths. So if they give you a half-truth, you have to make this decision based upon not all the information. If they give you the entire story, you will make the right decision. If I give you part of the story, I can influence your behavior to make a horrible decision. This all started off with me going to DEF CON and Black Hat. I spoke to some IT managers and I spoke to some self-identified hackers. Before I proceed on, let me preface, they're self-identified hackers. I did not make them tell me if they're doing anything illegal because that wouldn't happen. White hat, black hat, gray hat. Black hat, you're hacking for malicious purposes. White hat, you're hacking for good. Gray hat, people will say if, if it's real or not. You're kind of like Batman. It might be bad, but it depends on if you squint your eye and you look one way, but, it, but you mean well kind of thing. White hat, black hat, gray. They self-identified. So how many of them were there? There's about over 500 total. Um, almost an even split of people that I interviewed. What the goal was to align what the hackers are doing to see what the IT managers are doing. I'm hoping that the, my IT manager brethren, what they're doing is going to line up straight up with what the hackers are doing. In a perfect world, that's what we'll see. However, this is not a perfect world, so this is what I saw. I love these conferences. I speak at these conferences very often. Typically, there's someone from Cisco, Palo Alto, or something like that. They come up, they give a presentation on a firewall that is way too expensive for everybody. I'm in the audience, and I'm thinking, dude, I wish we could afford it. So I'm stretching my IT cybersecurity budget till it's breaking, till I'm like deep in the red. And then, no results change. There's still a data breach. And because that data breach, I'm looking back at the technology, me, I'm like, hold up, hold up. We just spent so much money on this. How, how are we still getting breached? So this study 
revealed 91% of hackers, and it's gonna start to sound like a toothpaste commercial very soon, so just, just ride with this. 91% of hackers say that they start with people instead of technology. 91% of IT professionals, they start with technology, and they start training their, they start training their people. How they train the people? CBTs, computer-based training. You click next 15 times like you're installing some software you don't care about, you get your certificate, you print it out, you give it to, you put it on the fridge, you give it to your manager, say, hey, I did it, they put it in the file, it gets dusty, and you're good for the year. Do the same thing, rinse and repeat next year. However, digging a little bit further, without going through this entire thing with you, I understand you can read it, about 60% of hackers said the easiest way into your network is email. The easiest, quickest way access to your, to your information is through email. It is the perfect attack vector. Why I say perfect and I mean every bit of that word perfect is because every single business in here accepts email. I know I can get to your network through email. I just have to get through the spam filter some way, somehow. It's how we do business. Every, everybody does email. We all have business cards. You hand your business card out, what it has, your phone number and your email address. Phone number, email address. I can reach you, I just have to manipulate you a little bit. So I started looking like this. <laughs> I started thinking like, dude, ain't no way we fall in victim to the Nigerian prince. If you don't know what the Nigerian prince is, there is a man out there in Nigeria for years, he has been waiting to give people $1 billion, but he is still looking for someone to give you $1 billion. And he sent me here today, if you give me your bit, no, I'm just playing. <laughs> this, this is what I'm thinking, though. I'm like, how, how so? So I go back to work, and I'm like this. Like, dude, how the heck are we clicking phishing links? But I had to take a step back and really think about what's going on here. This is not face to face. If I walk up to any of you, tap you on the shoulder about 15, 20, 30 times, and start asking you the same question over and over again, like, like kids do. They just keep asking the same question over and over. There, it's gonna be a bad day for Dr. Huffman eventually. However, if I send you 50 emails straight, a lot of times I go to the spam message, sometimes you're just gonna delete me. You're just gonna keep deleting me. Which gives me an upper hand, I can be more persistent. Because I can be more persistent, I can cater my attack a little bit more. I'm not getting physically attacked or getting the police called on me for pestering you. I can pester you from the comfort of my own home and I can do it as many times as I would like to nauseam. Also, this environment creates anonymity. Granted, it may say john.doe at gmail.com, and you may think that's my name, but anyone can create that. Anyone can create that account. So you don't really know who I am, and I'm anonymous, and I can pester the absolute heck out of you without any ill will, not any negative connotation coming back towards me. This is the perfect environment to conduct something like this to influence behavior. But also, I can send one email out to millions of people all at once. I can just BCC everybody, say the same thing over, and cast a broad net. Is that the best way to do it? Not really. Is it the most efficient way to do it? Eh, you can argue. But could, can I do it? Yes. To people I don't know and maybe get one response out. So if I send 10 million emails, if I get two responses, it's a good day. If I continue to do that, even better day. This is the perfect environment to conduct something like this. This psychological deficiency that we're gonna dig into, this is the perfect way and the perfect environment to do it. So let's nerd out for a second. I promise there's no math, but there is a test. No, there's no test. You have the limbic system. What the limbic system is, the limbic system is a part of your brain. It has fight or flight. It moderates fight or flight and feelings. You do not speak using your limbic brain. So as you're talking, you're not using your limbic brain, not even a little bit. But if you've ever been in a situation where something just doesn't feel right, like something's just off and you don't quite know what, that's your limbic brain helping you out there. Saying, hey, something is off, I just don't quite know how to say it. 
So this is something everybody has. Biological function, fight or flight. Fight or flight, spoiler alert to you guys, it is not a choice. It's going to be an innate, natural reaction. You're not going to think twice about it. You're going to shock yourself one way or the other. I did not know I could run that fast, or I'm a lot tougher than what I thought. So the same news stories that come out that say, hey, you know, this woman and this man picked up the car to pick up a car to save their kid, fight or flight scenario. Endorphins rush through, you're drilling in pumps, you're gonna start doing things that you didn't even know you can possibly do. Biological function, everybody has it. There's two parts that I like to know about the limbic system, the hypothalamus. Hypothalamus, think about it like a bunch of cables. A plus B equals love. B plus C equals hate. C plus D equals anger. Those endorphins rush through your body because of the hypothalamus based on what's going on at that moment. You see a picture of your husband, your wife, your kids, you begin to feel love, limbic system helping you out there. Next is the amygdala. This is public enemy number one. It does a lot of functions for you guys. But this is, what's, this is where the problem lies. Amygdala, what it is, moderates feelings. Fight or flight comes from there specifically. Bad thing about it, it can be hijacked. Not just the amygdala, your entire brain. So fight or flight happens. Someone runs in the room. Immediately, you think fight or flight. As you are in flight mode, Dr. Huffman is in full sprint, knees up, you know, casting out, foot striking underneath the hips, perfect sprint form. I am out. I'm not thinking like, man, I hope that was a good talk. No, my mind's hijacked. Only thing I'm focused on is staying alive at that moment. I'm not thinking like, man, that steak salad was really good. No, amygdala hijacked, entire brain hijacked. You're focused on one specific thing. There's two parts of your brain. If you wanna make it real simple, layman's terms. Survival brain, limbic system, amygdala. Logic brain, everything else. When you deductively reason, everything else. When you're staying alive, survival brain. We're not built for this. So if I was to influence your behavior and put you in hijack mode, you're panicking. Because you're panicking, you're focused on one thing and one thing only, and you're not reasoning. You click. This environment is prone for you to make this one bad decision. One single click for one single second. I don't need to fool you for an entire day. I don't need to fool you for an entire week. I need 30 seconds. I just need you to panic, I need you to click. And this is everybody. I'm not saying, hey, because you're a cyber professional, you're a cyber professional and you're not prone for this. You don't have an amygdala. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you don't have a limbic system. Yeah, you do. Every single person has this. We all can be hacked. Tell me I'm wrong. So if you're in an environment, a couple things happen. Phishing email comes in. You do not see a face. You do not see a picture or a video or anything. You simply see a name. When you see a name, think of your husband, your wife. You see it, you begin to feel love, you begin to feel happy, then you start reading. However, when you start reading, you start reading in their voice. That's the default. The default for them, in your mind, is their voice. Think from cyber criminal perspective. I put John Doe. I sent it to Jane Dotdo. Jane starts to read in John's voice, and John is saying everything I want him to say because she thinks it's from him, which is why you do not th see phishing emails come from memes because if I give you a picture, then you start to read in their voice. There was a picture of Morgan Freeman. You begin to read in Morgan Freeman's voice. Morgan Freeman has the most amazing voice in human history, if you ask me. You begin to read in his voice. So if I can create this environment where John is now saying all the negative things 
saying that he really needs help and that he's in desperate need, just respond back real quick. I'm counting on you. Jane, if she gets to hijack mode, she's panicking. She's not thinking rationally. She's just acting. And she's acting to help a loved one. However, what's the default default? Your voice. The default is you. When you read an email coming from a complete stranger, you read that email in your voice. You don't read in some creepy man's voice. You don't like imagine someone in their mom's basement, just like Mountain Dew everywhere, Cheeto dust, dude has a Kool-Aid mustache, just rock and roll playing in the background, wearing a Slayer shirt. You don't read in that voice. That's not the default. The default is your voice. And you trust yourself. I trust myself. I've been keeping myself alive for 33 years. I can trust myself pretty decently right now. And because I trust myself, the bad guy has an upper hand. Because that limbic stranger danger, which you've been taught as a child, stranger danger, we've all been said those two words, doesn't happen. You see an unfamiliar name. And if you're a business professional, you see a ton of unfamiliar names every single day. This doesn't raise a red flag like, hey, I don't know John Abshire and just came up that name off the top of my head. I don't know that person. You just kind of move through the side. You don't think like, ah, who is this? But when you start reading that email, you start reading in their voice. We'll take it one step forward. Am I wrong? I love this show. The same thing happens and you can't stop it. You can't stop yourself from seeing information this way, from reading information this way, from a biological perspective, because it's just how your brain is wired. It's how this works for you. So there's a topic I want to speak about briefly, and I call it threat language. This is an excerpt from a phishing email, and I collect these. You know, I'm a weird guy. I want to get phishing emails. So if you're watching this, you want to send a phishing email, send it to your boy. I want to see what you got. Because I want, to see how this, I want to see how this happens. This is an actual excer excerpt from a phishing email that I received, and I'm going to break it down to you real quick. What threat language is? There's a few words in here that are designed to trigger you, that are designed to get you to feel something. Understanding there are some typos in this email. It is what it is. Well, let's go over these words. The top one, it says, I adjusted the antivirus on an adult website which you have visited. When the object clicks on a, pl on a play button, the device begins recording the screen. What, the de what this threat language is, is a few key words in it. The actions, the start begins. Start begins when you click, start begins. So you begin to think like, okay, this event has already started occurring. This event has already happened. So you start to feel. You start to feel panic. If you visited an adult website, you start to feel panic. This event has begun, which means all these things after that, all the things in between, have happened. Biologically, this is the language that they're attempting to use. On the bottom here, it says, moreover, my program makes a remote, uh, remote desktop supplied with the keylogger function from your device. Keyword here, keylogger. Not a lot of people know exactly what a keylogger is. It just sounds malicious. And based on the words keylogger, I can kind of guess what it is. I don't technically know what it is, but it sounds bad. So you have this event has started, and now you have something that you don't truly understand, but it sounds super malicious. You have part, part of the information. You don't have the entire story. Because you don't have the entire story, you might hit panic mode. If you might hit panic mode and you're going to start wondering, you're going to start clicking. Last one. It says, you have, you have one day after opening my message. So understand this. Because you read that sentence, you have opened the message. This applies to you directly. I am speaking to you. After you open this, you have one day. What one day is, one day is a time limit. 
One day is a deadline, which means I have one day from when I'm reading this to act. So I may not think, I might, I might want to take some time to overthink this. However, if I hit panic mode, I, I, there's no time. We have one day. So you start pacing. This, the only analogy I have for you right now, if you've never been through this, you are a way better student than I was. So if I get my math test, and oh my gosh, I'm horrible at math, and it says F, I start thinking, oh, I have five hours until I'm home, and mom is not going to be happy. So I start pacing. And so if you see this, hey, you have one day after reading this message, you start panicking, you start pacing, and you're not thinking about what is actually going on? The logic part of your brain starts to malfunction on you because you start to get hijacked. It's a function. You start to get hijacked. And then it goes on to say they will share this with individuals. It's recording you, and they will share this out. This is no joke, the unfortunate truth, about this exact attack. People have committed suicide because of this. Depending on what you're doing, and no offense to, to anyone, I want to preface that. Imagine you're running for public office, you haven't visited uh, an adult site, and this information may come out. You're, you're, you're done. Or imagine you're in a situation where your husband or your wife says, hey, next time you, you visit these sites, we're done. I, I see this as, I see this as a, a variant of cheating. And this is coming out. You don't have the money to pay. You panic. For those exact reasons, people have legitimately committed suicide over this exact attack. Talk about hijacking. That's hijacking to a level I can't, I can't articulate. I've never, I've never been in that situation, thankfully. But if, you, if these individuals that have, understand they're not thinking rationally. Going forward through this talk, one thing I want to dispel. We have created an environment that we start saying, because you clicked a phishing link, because you've been fished, you're stupid. No, it's not the case. You're not, you're not stupid. There is functions here that are being exploited. Humanistic, psychological functions that are being exploited perfectly. Not because these guys are linguists or anything. Obviously, you know, there's, there's a typo right down there, second line from the bottom. And then they use your, you are. However, none of that matters. None of that matters when the context and the content sounds so dead on that it causes you to just freak out. And also, because this may be a form of spear phishing, spear phishing is targeted directly at this person. You don't know this hacker, you know, they might be lazy. To see your, to see you are, you know, if you go on Twitter, you go on Facebook, there's plenty of times. You know, grammar incorrectness and the English language, by all means, as, as long as you're trying, it sounds okay to me. Like, hey, you try it because, man, people don't know the difference between there, there, and there, your, and your, two, two, and two. If, if you're trying, it sounds decent to me. But let's continue on. Very last one with threat language here. It says, our spider detected five deadly Trojans in your mailbox today. If left unchecked, this can lead to total email shutdown. So if, as a, as a business owner, as a small business owner, you have someone that is protecting your data, and this comes from them, it seems like it's coming from them, but obviously the message may be off when analyzed uh, totally. But it says, hey, there's, there's been Trojans on your inbox. You may not understand exactly what a Trojan is. This, again, is putting you in a situation where you don't know all the, all the information. Total email shutdown today in the business world is horrific. Total email, I need to prevent anything from happening from total email shutdown. These are the languages that they're using, the words that they're using to target you. How are they targeting you specifically? Reconnaissance. Recon is data collection. There's two types, active and passive. Active reconnaissance is going out to actually manipulate data, unlock data, find data to, to touch it somehow and manipulate it and work with it or contact somebody to get that information. Passive is just checking online what you're putting on your social media. If you put something on your social media, anything you say can and will be used against you. The better I know you, 
the better I can trigger you. If I find out your kids' names, oh, I can use that. If I find out who you shop with, man, I can use that. If I can find out who you do business with, I can definitely use that against you. So, how does this work? If they're gonna conduct this attack, what are the phases involved into this? Comfort zone establishment? So I'm gonna ask a simple question. Who see email as a formal setting? Just by a show of hands. Who thinks email is formal? Me neither. A good friend of mine, um, she, was, uh, she was the, the librarian of the school I was a dean at. We send memes every day. I don't, I don't know if we said a word to each other in a couple years, but we just send memes every day, back and forth. Email is not formal. There's, ha there's times where you become hackable, there's times where you're not hackable. When you're in a formal setting, like me right now, standing up here, I'm focused totally on my talk. I'm focused on the information because I really want to do a good job. If someone comes up and says, hey, Dr. Huffman, can I get your social security number? No, 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 not, not now. Now's a very bad time to do that. The more comfort you are, if you're in your comfort zone, if you're just relaxing, I can manipulate this. I can manipulate where you are right now. If email is a formal setting, and I asked this very same thing at NASA, I asked this very same thing at the University of Maryland, all everywhere, no one raises their hand. You're, in a, you're just in the majority right now. No one raises their hand that, hey, email is very formal. Well, you're comfortable. And because you're comfortable, I can establish this. I just need to get you comfortable with me. The setting is comfortable, I need you to get comfortable with me. What's next? Engagement. Engagement's reaching out, talking to you. Like, hey, how's it going? Uh, I enjoyed our conversation at the Cybersecurity Summit in Colorado Springs. So let's, let's continue this conversation. Because if I just look online and I can see a list and see who's there, I can give you that proof that, hey, I was there and like, hey, I, I met a lot of people that day. I don't quite remember that name. But I met a lot of people. Let's, uh, let's, continue, let's continue this conversation. Next, you attack, and then you confirm your attack. And that attack can occur in a multitude of ways. It can be spear phishing. It can be a Trojan. It can be ransomware. Anything I can send and attach in an email, anything can be done. One of, one of my good friends is that takes Texas A&M, and he gave me a quote from the neuroscience department. And the quote is, the more I know, pretty much creativity, well, the more I know, the better and more creative I can get. The more I know you, the more creative I can get when exploiting you. The more I know you, the better, in, the better targeted this attack can be. So if I don't know you at all and I'm casting a broad net, like, hey, if I'm going to send that email out to 10 million people, I'm going to get less results. But if I target you specifically and I get creative with it, the higher your success rate. And that continues to be a trend. Because they want to create a digital footprint or a digital fingerprint of you. And everybody has a digital footprint. What a digital footprint is? You and everybody attached to you. Because in these conferences, one thing I love is because I love to give presentations and just nerd out with people that would be willing to listen to me. However, a lot of times you're preaching to the choir. Some people, they, you're here because you want to know this information. You want to get more secure. You want to be a little bit better off today than you were yesterday. So you're good. If you're good, I may not be able to exploit you, but what about everybody around you that's attached to you? I'm a football fan, so I'm gonna give this football analogy, and I gave the same one at TED. I do not want to target the cyber guru directly if we're playing football and I'm the quarterback. 
I'm not going to hand the ball to the running back and have them run directly at J.J. Watt, who's like one of the best defensive players in the league right now. We're not going to do that. We can still get first downs. We can still score touchdowns by going around, away, or even passing the ball. They can still get to you, but they may, may, may not be able to target you directly, but your business partners. The military has seen this a lot. The military is hacked not frequently, but when they get hacked, a lot of times it's through a third party. A third party gets hacked, so they get military information. The OPM breach. OPM got breached, they got military information. It's not you, it may be your partners. So they're creating that digital footprint. So what this follow-up study did after DEF CON? The follow-up study, one thing I want to note from this, I did semi-structured interviews. As a researcher, I have to say this stuff, but it just comes out. What semi-structured interviews is, I, gave, I asked them a question and I let them speak. I did not stop them. They spoke until they were done. Whether it's five sentences, whether it's five minutes, whether it's 15 minutes straight on a topic. So I let them speak to their heart desire. But then we conducted, we also conducted surveys. Just sending out a survey, let people check boxes, and then we cross-correlated that information. What this showed, younger people, I'm a proud millennial, don't judge me. I'm a proud millennial. We are easier exploited than older generations. Why so? Because younger individuals like myself, if you ask me to balance a checkbook, I can do it, but it's going to take me a little bit of time. But if you ask me to renew my tags, I can do it in two seconds because I'm going to go online. And that information online might be personal, might be PI, however I'm used to it. I don't know how many times I've put in my social security number in an online form, in a digital form. It's just quite normal. Not to say it's always malicious, sometimes it's completely leg legitimate. You might be doing work with the bank. If you're doing work with the bank, they may need some PI, so you just fill in their PI and you just send it off and you're good to go. Because we're technology natives doesn't mean that we know it more, it means we're more comfortable with it. We don't question it. And because we don't question it, a lot of times we're exploited because of it. To continue on, the only subscale that created a difference between younger individuals, older individuals, are perseverance. Perseverance and consistency and commitment is the best thing a tacker can have. So if someone walks in this room, walks up to you and says, hey, I'm gonna steal all your information and just walks away. You might be thrown off a little bit. I might be thrown off in a little bit. Everybody will think it's weird, but eventually you're gonna feel odd, but it's gonna subside. But if that same person walks up to you and says, for eight hours a day, every single day, I'm gonna try to hack you, and I'm not gonna stop until it happens, and then walks away. Now that's a problem. That, that is 100% a threat. To continue on, the same study. The more self-monitoring you are, the more self-engaged, the more self-motivated you are, the more hackable you are. Not because you're a good employee, but because if you're willing to figure it out, it's like, hey, I'm not gonna ask for help. I'm gonna figure this out. I'm gonna reason my way through this. Because you're reason way, your way through this, I'm attacking you and your privacy. So it's like, all right, you're not gonna ask for help. You're not gonna call anyone for understanding. Because you're not gonna call anyone for understanding, it's just you and me, just one-on-one. -on -one. It's a good thing, but at the same thing, at the same time, you become more hackable for it. And surprisingly, when we sent out a phishing campaign and we target the crap out of a bunch of people that volunteered, cybersecurity professionals, they clicked on links at a higher rate than everybody else. This is not a knowledge thing. This is a biological, humanistic thing. I mean, we're talking like 30, 36% success rate, all the way to like 47 with cybersecurity professionals. We did good. You know, I was proud of that. I was like, all right, cool, man. Like, all right, we, we getting cybersecurity professionals. And then I'm like, hold on, wait, I'm one of them. Like, I'm like, oh man, like this statistic is about me. So cyber, why cybersecurity professionals? All right, we, we did a follow-up study because I was fascinated 
buy this. Because we sent a bunch of emails. One of them included the word cybersecurity. And so we're told, hey, because I saw the word cybersecurity, I, I thought, hey, I shouldn't click on links that I don't know. So I didn't click on the cybersecurity link. I'm like, well, OK. Like that, 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 makes, that makes sense. But however, when you see the same thing and it's actually legitimate and trying to help you out, they're not clicking those either. But cybersecurity professionals, we get very comfortable. I mean, very, I mean, I'm collecting phishing emails right now. We're, we get very comfortable. But we're not, we're not different than anybody else. We have the same attack vectors as everybody else. Digging deeper into that, when we wipe everything clean, 29% of people revealed PI. Not only did they click a link, but we got personal information from them. And this is just a very broad stroke. We're sending out emails just to everybody, not really specifically targeting anyone. If we wanted to specifically target, this rate would go up. But we actually got PI from, from these individuals when we take out age, race, gender, and all that stuff. Actual PI. So how do these people look? This is what we would call the big five for cyber victims. And we thought it was correct, but we added something new to it. If you're an extrovert, a lot of my friends are extroverts. They, they say, hey, strangers are friends I haven't met yet type of thing. If you're an extrovert, you're willing to meet new people. You're willing to talk to new people. A lot of business owners are extroverts. This is how you grow your company. Public enemy number one there. Number two, if you're agreeable. Obviously, if you're agreeable, I can get you to agree to these terms and click on this link, give me your, give me your information. If you're conscientious, conscientiousness almost goes without saying. The more conscientious you are, the more you, you'll begin to work with me. This is where this gets a little weird. I'm not making fun of anyone. I'm not telling you because you're emotionally stable, you're going, there's something wrong with you. However, if you've had a friend that has not been emotionally stable, the girlfriend broke up with him, boyfriend broke up with him, just crying in tears, it's just, you can't get them to do anything. Like, hey, this, this person has done you wrong time and time again, just stop, just stop. And it just, you, they just won't work with you at that point in time. As a criminal, I need you to work with me. I need you to be emotionally stable. I need you to be in the moment. We need to get this done. We need to get your PII on my computer as quickly as possible. Imagine you're, you're sending a phishing email out and they reply back, but man, let me tell you about Joanne. She did me so dirty. Like, oh, come on, dude. Like, come, work with me here. Work with me here. Click, click this link. Well, you know, Joanne sent me a link. Oh, geez, come on, man. Like, this is not working out for me. The more emotionally stable you are, the more you are willing to work with a criminal. Not that there's anything wrong with you. This is just the personality traits of a cyber victim. Last one here, open a new experience. If you're open to new experience, you never sent PI in an email before, will you do it now? If you're willing to ride a brand new roller coaster, however, and you're willing to do something new, you might be able to do this. Not that there's anything wrong with any of these personality traits, but you just fall victim in that. However, there's a new one. The most risky personality trait you can have is impulsiveness. If you impulse buy, if it takes you three seconds to make a decision, split decision, and you take it and you roll with it and you commit to it. This is the riskiest personality trait you can have. Not that there's anything wrong with you again. However, just be self-reflective and understand. If you're impulsive to the scenario and you get hijacked and you just start thinking like, okay, I'm panicking, I'm panicking, do it. That is the worst thing that you can possibly have at that moment in time in that particular scenario. Everybody's impulsive in different, in different ways. When it comes to food, you got your boy. Brand new restaurant, does it, I'm not even, it's not even impulse. I'm not even thinking about it. Like, hey, that's where I'm going. I might not even be hungry and I'm there. That's, that's the level. Everybody's impulsive in different situations, but the more impulsive you are, if you're just consistently impulsive, you're consistent, this is just who you are, that is a bad thing because this can work against you in this particular scenario. 
And new variants of attack create impulsiveness. New variants of ransomware creates impulsiveness. The Jigsaw ransomware. Jigsaw ransomware is just like the movie Saw. After every hour, it deletes a file. After three days, it deletes everything. Could you imagine two, two days and you're going on the 11th hour and you don't have much time left? You're, it's creating that pressure. And as it creates pressure, that pressure creates impulsiveness. So you're like, man, I, I've lost a lot. I don't want to lose everything. Don't want to lose everything. Don't want to lose everything. You calling your, your service provider. Your service provider is like, hey, I'm working on it. I don't think we're going to make it in time. You're like, I don't want to lose everything. Don't want to lose everything. Screw it. I'm buying. And you just, you buy it. That creates impulsiveness. You may not be impulsive by nature, but by situation, you might impulse buy your own data back. From the study, this is some of the quotes, and I'm not going to read them all to you, but I want to go over a couple of them. So based on this, in our semi-structured interviews, we we're told, I think cybercrime is a waste of time. A lot of people are losing faith in it. Cybercrime is now just crime. You get more money in cybercrime than they do in drug crime these days. It's the number one money-making crime wave out there right now. The thing is, reporting it is totally a waste of time, that nothing is going to get done to it. The fourth one now, if I report a cyber attack, it would damage the company's reputation. That goes hand in hand. That gets tied to something else that we like to call where individuals get that comfort zone, that comfort vector, and also they do not want to harm the company. But they don't want to look dumb either. They say, hey, I clicked on the link. I don't want to, I don't want to look dumb. If I, if I say I'm the one who clicked on the link, I'm going to get fired. Boss is going to be mad at me. The average time from the date of occurrence to the date of detection on a cyber attack, 90 days, three months, and that's if you're good. If, you're, if it's like 120 days, you're doing all right. If it's like a year, or you're really dropping the ball. But 90 days from the date of attack to the date of detection. And over 97% of all cybercrime come through email. We're talking 90 days. Someone's not talking. Because if you invite the attack in, it looks bad on you and it looks bad on the company. And on top of that, the company may not want to say anything either. We don't want to say, hey, we really got, we got a cyber attack because it's going to really damage us. It's going to damage the reputation. They're going to go to our competition. To continue on, semi-structured interviews, even with cyber prof professionals. 31% of people say they disable antivirus so they can download software. This is, this, is third, this, is, this is a lot of honesty coming out here. If this is what's going on, uh, obviously you're, you're opening the door, you're inviting it in. You're inviting in the thought process and in, in the attack. If you disable the antivirus, you might forget to turn it back on. Also, 67% share location over social media. A lot of that's by accident. And I want to preface that and to say, hey, a lot of that by, was by accident. Um, you just post a picture. Little do you know that picture has a geolocation on based on where you are. You may post about the cybersecurity summit so they know where you are. They can just look up what a cybersecurity uh, summit is. To continue on, they store company PII, 53%, on their personal computer. Over half. And also, the last one down there, they use their personal uh, USB to move company information. So we did another study. We cross-correlated this information here. We wanted to really dive deep to figure out why, how, and when. So quick, layman's terms, we had two groups. We had one group. We said, hey, here's your username and your password. We wrote it down, um, and you'll have that information for you after a couple days or something like that. Another group, we said, hey, here's your username and password. Good luck to remembering it. You have a few minutes with it. Memorize it. We're going to take it away. You're good to go. Bye. The group that had to memorize their password did significantly better than the group that had to, get writ that had to have it written down. 
Because when we brought those people back, we said, hey, what's your password? Simple question. What's your password? Write it down. Recite it. So they wrote it down. The people that had it written down for them, most of them could not even come close to recall it. At like a 70% failure rate that they could not recall that. So this goes to show. If your password is written down, you're not memorizing it. If your password is stored in your head, you're going to memorize it. But we've, we're starting to move away from passwords. Microsoft, in Microsoft Server 2019, they stated that your password expiration policy was useless. It's turned off by default. You have to turn on password expiration policy now. When before, every operating system before then, that is the default. Your password is going to expire after 45 days, 60 days, something like that. What Microsoft said is that because your password expiration policy, if it's like 60 days and someone stole your password anyway, that's way too long. And what they found is if there's no password expiration policy and we give you a password similar to what we did, if we give you a password and say, hey, you have to memorize this, you'll come up with a more complex password and a harder to break password that way. But we're moving towards biometrics. That's what we're doing now. And we're creating an environment now. What if your face ID is stolen? The biometrics from your face, what if that's stolen? What happens then? You can't change your face. You can't Nicolas Cage someone's face and put it on your face like this is my, pa like you're my password now. Like look at me, you're my password now. Like no, that, that doesn't happen. We're creating passwords that are not changeable. Your thumb, your right thumb, what if that gets stolen? You got nine more left and that's it. Because after your password is known, there's one thing worse than ABC123, our password being your password. That is a password that I know. Because it can be as complex as you want it. It can be 50 characters, all special characters, even a poop emoji at the end. If I know it, that doesn't help you at all. I know it. So this is what it's coming down to. Training, we're doing this wrong. We host, we have a lot of people that ask us for phishing campaigns. And say, hey, we like what you're doing. We love the research. Can you, can you fish us? And so we ask a few rules. We say, hey, what's the rules? Can we attack families? And they're like, I don't know if we, we want to do that. Like, can, can, can I spoof your kid's name? Yeah, I, I don't know if we, if we want to do that. So I'm like, all right, so, so what can you do? Attack the firewall. Dude, like, that's, that's not how we fight. That's not what's going on. You know, in the military, they say, train how you fight. And that's what we need to do, train how we fight. So what most fishing campaigns look, look like, they fish everybody. You know, they send maybe the Nigerian prince, maybe something a little more targeted about the company. You click on the link and they say, hey, no, slap your wrist. You need to take this computer-based training. So what you do, sit in front of computer-based training, click next 15 times, show it with a smile, take a picture, get your name put on the wall, and then, then it's good. However, they don't ask, why did you click that link? In this study, we asked, why did you click this link? And the information that we got was shocking. I didn't want to put people out on blast, so I didn't put this on a slide. However, we were told things like, my boss scares me. You spoof my boss name, my boss scares me. I'm like, why, why does your boss scare me? He's like, well, when I was first brought in, he, laid, he fired two people. So I, I don't want to disappoint my boss. So I'm like, dude, all right, well, let's, let's, talk, let's talk to your manager because we need to address this. Because unless you address that, you're going to fall victim to that. You're going to feel anxious. You're going to feel hijacked, and you're going to do whatever your boss says do because they scare you. And we started working, we started working with families as well. You know, we're spoofing husband's name. We're spoofing wife's name. And what we heard was fascinating. It was, hey, my wife and I were going through some difficult times, and I just, I just wanted to do something that made her happy. So I sent money. So we're like, man, 
we're in this virus, we're, we're conducting a study now, and I'm like, how do we answer this? Because when it comes down to training, if we're not addressing the problem, we're not addressing the solution. Hey, you click the link, we, that's, that's your behavior that, click, that you click the link. What influenced you to do that? And it's different from everybody. The training that's effective for me may not be effective for you because the attack's going to be a little bit different. We may receive the same email, and I might be like, dude, that's so dumb. But you might be like, dude, that's, that's amazing. Like, that, that hits me. And so you start to pry into it. We sent, some, we sent another phishing email within a company request, uh, asking for information so we can give them money. More targeted. We got so many clicks back. We got so much PII back. Because when we started doing an interview, why did you click this link? I'm about to lose my house. And when we start raising risk and reward, the risk is, hey, you can clear my bank account out. I'm actually negative right now. But if I actually got the money, we can eat. So I'm like, how do we answer this? This form of training that we are currently doing, doing they're not training how we fight. Because the fight is now on home turf. When you think fishing, I don't want you to think Nigerian Prince. I don't want you to think Coca-Cola because they're a lot better than that. Don't even think about the email with the typos that I, show, that I showed you today. Because my team, myself, one other technically minded person, a psychologist and an English major. Psychologist because we want to we trigger you. English major, got to make sure it looks right. And because it looks right, and we know what we're targeting, the success rate is through the roof. Because you're triggering people on a level that, they, that we're not addressing. Not to say we need to fix people, like there's something wrong with you. I'm saying what we are currently doing with training is not addressing the problem. The problem may be deep within who you are. I've been in a situation where I've wanted to click a phishing link. I've been in a situation where I've replied to phishing links. That fish came from someone spoofing my mom. My mom's name is not even common. You know, people call her Miss Rita. That's a short for her name, Miss Rita. I get an email from her with her full name and asking for help. In my mind, I started thinking about how she helped me out. And I started thinking, hey, I can help mom. Because mom and dad, you know, they, they, they may have been having issues. I can help mom right now. So I reply, like, how, how much money do you need? Me. I'm not better than anyone else, but I'm a cyber professional and I started studying this. And I reply, how, like, how much do you need? Because it's not reasonable, it's not rational to tell you that you're going to see a name of a loved one, see a picture of a loved one, and you're going to feel nothing about it. That's asking too much. Or, hey, you're going through so much at home, but whenever you come to work, whenever you look at your work email, screw what's going on at home. You're going to bring that with you. And you're creating your own attack vector. So we start looking at the information, a little bit of what I shared before. When you start looking at what criminals are doing, we start looking at the future. And with the future, as we created and we innovated, so have they. We made programming pretty easy. Programming now is, is a little difficult, but it reads a lot more like English, and it's pretty easy to catch on and do. We've made configuring firewalls a little bit easy. We made working with, uh, with antivirus a lot easier. But we can't innovate and expect them to sit still and do nothing. They've innovated as well. So what have they, what have they done? Stop thinking about the criminal as the coder, because the criminal is not the coder right now. You can create ransomware by clicking 
and, add, and just saying how much your ransom is, click download and download your ransomware. This is Satan. Well, dang, that sounds weird. This is Satan. <laughs> so with Satan, Satan is ransomware as a service, R-A-A-S, ransomware as a service. There's another one called Raspberry, R-A-A-S, Raspberry, ransomware as a service, Berry. So how does it look? With Satan, you can just fill in what you want to create your malware, how much your ransom is, how much the multiplier you want it to be. After three days, do you want it to double? Do you want it to triple? Do you want it to go tenfold? And then on top of that, you just fill in the rest of your information and you just download it. You don't have to be technically minded at all. You just got to know how to fill in the blanks. And those are the blanks right there. And you just download it. So you're, not, you're no longer looking at the nerd in the basement. You're looking at anybody that needs anything. You need money, this is a way to make it. We already discussed how cybercrime, you can make more money than selling drugs. And it's more anonymous. You need money, here you go. Download this, start dropping thumb drives. And on those thumb drives, which can you write? Q4 layoffs. Drop them. Go into the offices. Someone's going to pick it up. Someone's going to panic. What? There's layoffs? Plug it into their computer. They have it just work. You didn't create anything. You just download it and you put it on your thumb drive. And you just drop it. Go to the mall. Do the same thing. Go into a bank. Go into a bank, put like CEO salary or something on it. And just drop it. With organizations, we do that and they're picked up every single time. Every single one, like 100% success rate. They pick it up, they look at it, and they may plug it in. They may think, when we interview back, we ask, hey, why did you plug that in? It's not always like, hey, I'm worried about layoffs. It's like, no, I just need to know who to give this back to. Even if we write nothing on. It's like, hey, I just need to know who to give this back to. I want to give someone their thumb drive back. I'm just trying to help. The same way you're trying to help, is the same way you can break into almost any facility with a box of donuts. If I'm holding a box of donuts or some pizza, and I say, hey, can you hold the door open for me? Who's going to deny donuts? You look, not this boy here. Who's going to deny donuts? Not, not many people are going to do that. It's that helpful attack vector. Train how you fight. You're, help, you're, you're helpful, not because you're helpful, you're a bad person. You're helpful because they're exploiting you now because you're helpful. And with this, this is making this hacking stuff extremely easy. Let's continue on with it. If you want to create something, if you want to spoof, you're like, hey, I want to, I want to create a, a Facebook account. I want to spoof Facebook's website. Cool. There's a hacker out there that's done it for you. You just click on it, you can download the web page, and you can present the web page up there. You've now spoofed Facebook. You can buy it. You don't have to create it. You can buy it. And this is a whole new attack vector. Because we started looking, and there's one up there that just opened my eyes. Plenty of fish, and the one down there first meet, and the other one all the way on the bottom on the left. Because when you think about it, this started to hit home. We're so in tune with this environment, you can literally fall in love. Legitimately, and there's nothing wrong with that. But if I can get you to feel love, what else can I do? You can manipulate behavior any way you want with this. And you don't even have to code it. You can create it. Looking at this, and I apologize, some of this is in a different language. This is the people who are attacking us sometimes. If you wanted to create a DDoS, to deny service to another business. You don't have to create it, you can buy it. That is very difficult to do. Imagine a situation now. You're working with a small business, you're, you're manufacturing widgets. You have a competitor, the competitor doesn't like you. The competitor wants to deny you service, next thing you know they paid for it, you're now down and out, your competitor sends up an advertisement, hey, come to the business that doesn't get DDoS that can provide you service 24 seven. This is a dirty game that's being played right now. A very dirty game that's being played. So these are the tiers of individuals that I'm telling you to watch out for. On the very top are the nerds of the nerds. 
The technical innovators. Down in the middle, you have your resellers. Down at the bottom, where there's more than anyone, there's the people that use it. The non-technical opportunists. 97% of cyber attacks come over email. 97% of them. Not all of them are technical. They may have a link that's be, that may be technical, but did they create that link or did they buy it? The ransomware that your organization may get. Did you get it from the innovator? Did you get it from the creator or did you get it from someone that bought it? The WannaCry ransomware made people millions, millions of dollars, caused billions of dollars worth of damage. The innovators created that, they deployed that. However, what the innovators did, they created another avenue where other people could make money. So how does this work? If someone buys the ransomware, you can buy the ransomware or you can buy the ransomware service. If you buy the ransomware, that's gonna cost you a lot, a lot of money. If you buy the service, me as a ransomware creator, 70-30 split. You get 70%, I get 30 but I'm selling it to everybody else. So I'm making a ton of money, and you're making your fair share as well. 70-30 split. When it comes across the wallets, you get your 70%, but I'm getting my 30, I'm getting my cut. That's how this is looking. You have the innovators on top, you have the non-technical opportunists uh, at the bottom. There's more of them than there are the technical innovators. And there's also more people writing well-written phishing emails than there are people that are actually coding and deploying technical capabilities. It's the unfortunate reality that we're more tuned with individuals that are hacking the federal government than the 99% that are hacking us. Occasionally I go to my spam and I just look and I just dream. I'm like, dude, I wish. I'm like, hey, you won this contest, you won this contest, you won this contest. But that's the spam filter. We're looking now at what's actually coming through, what's bleeding through. And as this information bleeds through, we start to blame the technology a lot more. Say, so, hey, why didn't that get caught by the spam filter? If that didn't get caught by the spam filter, like that, there's something wrong with that. I worked at a school. And as a school, I was, I was the dean there. We had an individual that clicked on a link and then went to another computer, clicked on the same link, Went on another computer, clicked on the same link, and I'm like, what the, like, what's going on? Like, well, the computer slowed down. The computer just began to slow down. I thought it was from Amazon. I'm like, dude, like, crap. And then I'm looked at it, because I received the same email. And I'm like, all right, this Amazon email? Like, this is the same, same one I got. Or like, however, I, I don't worry about Amazon too much. However, she buys a ton on Amazon. I don't. And so it affects her differently than it affects me. Doesn't have the same weight, doesn't have the same impact. It's based on who you are. Trust is the foundation for security. If I trust you, I give you access to information that you may not typically get access to. If I trust you, I may let you watch my kids or watch my house while I'm out of town. If I get you to trust me, you can certainly send me any information that I ask for. You can certainly send me any kind of money that I may ask for. There's a new attack vector that I didn't address up here. It's called deep fake or deep voice. What deep fake is, what deep voice is, it transfers your voice into someone else's voice where you start to sound like them. And so when you hear me on the other end of the phone, you're not hearing Dr. Huffman, you're hearing Chris Rock. Yeah, you're hearing Chris Rock. Man, Chris Rock would be a hard one to fake. But yeah, you're hearing, Chris, you're hearing Chris Rock. And so as you hear that, it's no longer fair because you're getting the vocal validation as well. Like I was on the phone with Chris Rock. He told me there's tickets, and so he asked for my credit card information, tickets to the new show. This is not going away. They're playing on that emotion. They're playing on that even more so than, than you would imagine. The largest deep, fake uh, largest deep fake attack occurred just recently a couple weeks ago where there is a European CEO that transferred $250,000 to another CEO because he was told to. 
It was a company that was owned by another company. So the CEO of the parent company asked the CEO of the child company or the sister company, hey, can you transfer me $250,000 for these purposes, and then uh, I would, I'll reimburse you the money back. The CEO get the call. What the report says is that that voice even had the slight German accent that the, um, that the uh, CEO had, the original CEO would have. Transfer $250,000. And was going to do it again, but didn't get reimbursed the first time, so he was like, nah, I'm not transferring it the second time. It's horrible what's going on. So I'm going to leave you with this. Understand that the 90% of the problem comes through email. And you're not clicking links because you're stupid. You're not feeling the way, you're not feeling like a victim because you're stupid. We've seen the big five are now the big six for cyber victims. A lot of people fall right into line of those. I mean, they're playing on you because you're ha helpful. They're playing on you because you're comfortable. And this attack vector is not going to die down because email is the perfect way to get to any organization because you're going to accept email. And so it's me, spam filter, then you. And if I get your email address legitimately, and I can send you an email legitimately, spam filter is not going to help you. I'm already in. I'm already in the door. And so from there, I can do anything I want. I just need to get access to your computer. Then I can pivot anywhere I want into the organization. And there's not much that you can do about that. This is a situation when I was an IT manager, it was for a very, very, very large organization. And we would just get attacked over and over and over again. And we had multi-million dollar defenses set up. It was like Fort Knox. We're protecting PHI and we're protecting credit card data very well. And I would get calls like, hey, what are you, you guys are doing well. I'm like, dude, we just had a data breach. But they didn't get everything. They got everything. What are you guys doing? Because once you get in, that perimeter security, there's nothing that it can do for you. They're in. They're in. They just got to get the information back out. And understand that it's 90 days from date of detection to the date of occurrence. Imagine if we all go to a mall today. And they say, hey, you have three months. I mean, we would have the carpet ripped out of that place. Three months. And that's average. Cybersecurity is more closely related to psychology than it is computer science. Until we understand and respect that, we have a long road ahead of us. Thank you.